This is the Hal Lindsey Report. And now, Hal Lindsey. Hello, and welcome to the Hal Lindsey Report for this week. You know, there's a growing issue in our country today and the world, frankly. It's even beginning to show up in our national political debate. It's the raging question, should we support Israel? And if we should support them, why? Those who have followed my writings and television shows frequently ask me a question. How, why in the world do you keep supporting and defending the Jews in the state of Israel? Some ask this question with an obvious bias against the Jews. They argue that Jews have stolen the Palestinians' land and supporting Israel has caused much of America's problems. So why do you defend them? But the most troubling to me are the Christians who attack me for supporting the state of Israel and the Jews. They attack me with various biblical arguments to show how I have misinterpreted the Bible and don't know what I'm talking about. The main source of their disagreement with me can be reduced to one major issue, their method of interpretation of the scriptures. This group believes that virtually all Bible prophecy is allegorical. This has resulted in a movement historically known as replacement theology. Briefly put, they believe that the covenants of God made with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were forfeited when they rejected Jesus as the Messiah and forced his execution. In their system, they believe that Israel has no place as a distinct people and nation in God's future prophetic program. They believe the church has replaced the Israelites forever as God's chosen servants to represent him on earth and have inherited the Jews' covenants. This system also teaches that virtually all prophecy in the Bible, such as Daniel, Ezekiel, and the book of Revelation, has already been fulfilled. The inevitable conclusion of this system of belief is that the present state of Israel and the Jewish people are imposters destined for destruction. It results in an anti-Semitic attitude toward the Israelites of today. Some even teach that there are no true descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the world today. You know, Hitler would have loved this group. I vehemently denounce this doctrinal system, first and foremost, because if it were true, it would mean that the God of the Bible is a liar. God made certain unconditional promises to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Taken at face value by the same method of interpretation that Jesus used when he interpreted the Old Testament prophecies, these covenants are binding forever, despite the failings of the Israelites and the modern Israelis. The scholar Dr. David L. Cooper said about the kind of interpretation they use, when the Bible uses an, an allegory or a figure of speech, it is usually obvious. But when an interpreter arbitrarily takes a passage that is obviously intended to be a literal statement of fact and treats it as allegory, he is twisting the Word of God and knowingly perverting its meaning. Let me show you some of these covenants God made with His people so that you can understand better. First, we're going to take the promises directed to Abraham and his descendants. This applies to the people. Number one, God said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, I will make you into a great nation. Two, I will bless you. Three, I will make your name great. Four, and you will be a blessing. Five, I will bless those who bless you. Six, and whoever curses you, I will curse. Seven, and in you, all the peoples on earth will be blessed. Now, let's look at this clause by clause. First, God said to Abraham that he would make him a great nation. Now, this inherently contained the promise of a son, since he had to have a son through which the nation could be created. Is also implicit in this statement that the covenant extends to that nation. And then in the second clause, God said he would bless Abraham personally. This was fulfilled. Listen, Abraham was protected through many perilous things in his times. He was blessed with vibrant health into old age. 
and everything he did, God prospered, even though many times he didn't deserve it. Now, the third clause, Abraham's name would be honored. Well, he has been honored over the whole world for over 4,000 years. And he's honored by being a part and being a foundational part of three of the world's largest religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And the fourth clause, Abraham has been the source of blessing for untold hundreds of millions. So when God said he would be a blessing, he certainly was. And fifth clause, as God's representative on earth, God knew the Jews would be objects of special attack. So God provided promises to bless those who would bless Israel. And then in the sixth clause, God promises that he will curse those who curse Israel. This part of the covenant was designed overall to protect Israel, and these are things that we as a nation need to carefully look at and be serious with. It becomes a real contest in our world today when you see it as I see it, between what the Bible teaches, what people just think on their own, or what false religions teach. Now in the seventh clause, God gives the true ultimate purpose of why he created this nation. He said, in your seed, I will bless all the families of the earth. Ultimately, this was the whole purpose of God creating the nation of Israel. They were chosen and created to be the special representatives for him. It was God's purpose to reach out through this nation to all the other nations of the world that were pushing God out of their cultures and memories. It is through Abraham's seed that God promises to bring the nations into a knowledge of his word and of a relationship with him. The next covenant applies to the land. This covers the land covenant. You know, these promises give the Jews a title deed to a specific piece of property. And it also gives Abraham and his descendants the only title deed that is unconditional and forever. Think about this. Of all the people on earth, only Israel, the Israelites, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, have a title deed to the land given to them by the Creator. All of us who live in every nation on earth, somewhere in the past, gained that land through the right of conquest. Here are the many passages that spell out God's covenants concerning the land for his chosen people. First, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, lift up your eyes from where you are and look north and south and east and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. Now that's the promise of the land and how long their ownership of it would last, forever. The next statement in Genesis gives the boundaries of this title deed. In Genesis chapter 15, verses 18 through 21, God says, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said, to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, Raphites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. Note especially here, the Jebusites, they were a race of giants that were the first known owners of Jerusalem. Now the exact dimensions of this land grant were literally spelled out. They've never come to possess all of it yet, but God said, they will ultimately inherit it forever. We've seen the original covenants that were made to Abraham. Now I want to show you how many times and over how many centuries these same covenants were reaffirmed to the people who were his descendants. First, let's look again in Genesis where God reaffirms this to Isaac. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever your wife Sarah tells you, listen to her, for through Isaac your descendants shall be named. In the covenant God reaffirms in this passage, Abraham was commanded to reject Ishmael, who was his illegitimate firstborn. This was because God had told him that the covenant would pass through a son born of his own wife, Sarah. 
And so God affirms that it is through Isaac that these covenants were going to be fulfilled. Later, the promises are reaffirmed to Isaac's son, Jacob. Note that both the covenant and the people of Israel and the title deed to the land are again promised to his descendants in this statement. Now, in Genesis chapter 26, verses 2 and 4, it says, The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants I will give all this lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, and will give your descendants all these lands, and by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Notice that God put together all the promises to the people of Abraham with the promise of the blessing he would be to all the earth. These covenants were reaffirmed in history and in the Bible several times. First, let's go to a reaffirmation of these great covenants a thousand years later through King David. In Psalm 105, verses 8 through 12, he said, He has remembered his covenant forever, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, the covenant which he made with Abraham, and his oath to Isaac. Then he confirmed it to Jacob for a statute, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you I will give you the land of Canaan as the portion of your inheritance. When there were only a few men in number, very few, and strangers in it. Now there's another reaffirmation made despite the many failures and disciplines of Israel over 1,400 years after Abraham. Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 35 through 37 says, This is what the Lord says, He who appoints the sun to shine by day, he who decrees the moon and the stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will the descendants of Israel ever cease to be a nation before me. This is what the Lord says. Only if the heavens above can be measured and the foundations of the earth below be searched out, will I reject all the descendants of Israel because of all the things they have done, declares the Lord. Now let's stop for a moment and think about this. He says, they will never cease from being a nation before him. And it's the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob he's saying this to. And then he says that this will be true despite the things that they would do. In other words, the failures they would commit. Now let's go to another reaffirmation that's in Ezekiel which is again in the general time of about 1,400 years after Abraham. In Ezekiel chapters 36, verses 22 through 28, as God predicts what he's going to do in the last days, just before the Messiah comes to set up the kingdom on earth that he promised Israel. He says, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you went. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from among the nations, gather you from all the lands, and bring you into your own land, then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my people, and I will be your God. Now I want you to note something carefully here. The prophet says this will only happen after Israel had been scattered throughout the world and profaned God's name through 
every nation. And it talks about bringing them back in the end time. It's at the time when God brings the Messiah to reaffirm and to establish the new covenant with them. And when he takes away their sins and he puts the Holy Spirit within them. Now, that can't be in the past. It has to be in our immediate future. I'll be back in just a moment. You know, one of the groups that I'm really coming against is today called the Preterist. They're the ones who push replacement theology today. The Preterists claim that a prophecy I'm about to show you predicts the end of Israel as a nation and a distinct people. They say it means that Israel's covenants were permanently taken away and given to the church in AD 70. But they ignore two vital points that are in this key prophecy made by the Lord Jesus himself. The word until and the phrase the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Let's read the passage in Luke chapter 21, verses 22 through 24. Jesus made this prophecy shortly before his death. He said, Because these are the days of vengeance, so that all things which are written will be fulfilled. Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. For there will be great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. And they, the Israelites, will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until, now that's a key word, until, akris in Greek, the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now they overlook the key word here, until, a conjunction. You see, this prophecy is talking about the destruction of Israel in A.D. 70 and their scattering throughout the world. And Jerusalem would continue to be trampled down by the Gentiles. But there's a time limit given here. Consider the fact that the word until is crucial. <laughs> now, just to put it in Texanese, for I'm a Texan, let's make it as simple as possible. The conjunction until mean certain things that were going on during the past are coming to an end, and then something new is going to start. Now, what has been going on in this prophecy? The people of Israel were going to be scattered throughout every nation. They were going to fall by the edge of the sword, and Jerusalem would continually be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. But then comes the conjunction until. It means there's something different going to happen after this. You see, Jesus shows there's still a plan for these people. In Matthew 25, beginning with verse 31, Jesus in another prophecy clearly shows that there's going to be a segregation when he comes back at the second advent. When he comes to the earth, the first thing he's going to do is gather all the surviving Gentiles apart from Israel. Jesus will separate the surviving Gentile believers as sheep from the goats. They go to his right hand. The goats are the unbelievers. They go on his left. And it means that they are no longer his representatives in the world as they had been in the church age. During the church age, there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, according to the book of Ephesians especially. But from the tribulation onward, there's a segregation. Ezekiel chapter 20 shows that the Israelites are going to be judged in an entirely different place at the second advent of Christ, out by Mount Sinai. And there the believers among them are going to be separated from the unbelievers. So Jesus shows there is a future for the Israelites and the covenants are still binding to them even after this terrible judgment. Now let's go to what I call hope in the olive tree. There are some tremendous lessons we can learn from Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. The Apostle Paul wrote those chapters to silence the people within the church who even at that time were becoming anti-Semitic. In chapter 9, he shows that Israel in the past was elected. Chapter 10 shows Israel in the present is rejected. But chapter 11 shows Israel in the future accepted. Romans 11, verse 22 says, Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, 
but kindness to you, provided that you continue in this kindness. Otherwise, you, now this is speaking generally of the Gentiles as contrasted with the Israelites as a group, you will also be cut off. And if they, the Israelites, do not persist in unbelief, they'll be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you Gentiles were cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature, and contrary to nature, were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the Israelites, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Now let's stop for a moment and think about that. What does the olive tree symbolize? This is obviously an allegory. The olive tree symbolizes the promises and covenants of the eternal relationship with God that was first vouchsafed and given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and passed on to their descendants. So they are the cultivated olive tree that possesses these things. Now, as discipline, some of the branches were cut out, and Israel is under a partial judicial blinding right now, in part, that is. But the point is, there's still this covenant. Now, let's go on to the rest of this quote from Romans 11. Paul says, I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until, now there's that word again, the conjunction until. In other words, they're in a partial hardening until what? Until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. You see, this is referring back to the exact thing that Jesus referred to in Luke 21, verse 24. The times of the Gentiles are completed when the full number of the Gentiles that are to be saved and brought into God's eternal family has come in. And then it says, and so all Israel will be saved. That is, after this, after the times of the Gentiles is finished, as it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion. He will turn godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies on your account. But as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs, for God's gift and his call are irrevocable. Now let's summarize. The main issue of this context is that Israel is under a judicial blindness in part and removed from its place of calling as God's representatives on earth. The time of the Gentiles refers to the fact that a Gentile-dominated church is currently God's representative on earth. But this is only until the full number of Gentiles are saved and the times of the Gentiles come to a close. Then God is going to graft the Israelites back into the covenants given their forefathers, and they as a remnant will believe and inherit all the promises. Now in the light of this, let's ask again the question, why should we support Israel? It becomes an issue of whether you're going to believe the God of the Bible, or we're going to believe man-made theories. It's almost a contest in much of the world today between the God of the Bible and the Allah of the Quran. God is going to have his way and the promise he made about putting a curse on those who curse Israel. Putting a curse on them means uh, that we bring harm to them, that we don't help them or bless them. Those conditions apply to our country right now. The United States of America is progressively turning against Israel. Our leaders care nothing about the fact that God said Israel is the only land and the only people who have a title deed to the land they possess. And it's spelled out. We're making them give it up piece by piece until they have no defensible position against relentless enemies that outnumber them 40 to 1. God is not going to let that happen. But in the process, all those who forsake God's people will be destroyed. And we need to wake up as a country and support God's chosen people. Why? Because God said so. And if we're smart, we'll pay attention to what God says.
because he keeps his threats as well as his promises. He will bring judgment on those who cause great suffering to those he has elected.